So over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about the people of the ancient city of Corinth. Not the, not the city of Corinth that's that way, but the ancient city of Corinth. And, and so before we really begin to talk about this letter that Paul wrote to them, it's probably important for us to stop for just a second and learn a little bit about who they were, what life was like for them. When I think about the city of Corinth, I actually think about the city of Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Uh, we lived, my family lived in Hattiesburg, Mississippi uh, for 17 years, and we loved it. It's a great city. There were a lot of universities, uh, two universities, big medical community. There's a military base, people from all over. And my daughter said that the best part of Hattiesburg was Target, right? Uh, that was the best part uh, of, of Hattiesburg uh, to them. Uh, and we moved here, they grieved uh, the loss of, uh, of Target. But it was, it was this unique place. And, and in, the, in the earliest days when Hattiesburg was founded, it earned a nickname. It was called the Hub City. And here's why. Because all of the railroad lines uh, in the south part of the state, and really the southeastern part of the United States, ran through Hattiesburg. And so you would have cargo and people who, who were traveling, who came through Hattiesburg and throughout the, uh, all of its existence. It's really been the hub city. Uh, today, if you go there, all these roads uh, converge in Hattiesburg and lead all over the southeastern United States. It's still a place because of the hospitals and the universities and the military base that people from all over, really all over the world, gather in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And Corinth was a lot like that back in its day. I have a map of Corinth uh, here for you. Corinth is kind of that dot, uh, big dot there in the middle to the left of Athens. And the city of Corinth was on this north-south trade route. But also, if you look at the map, you can see that there were ports to the east and to the west of Corinth. Everything that went to Rome from Asia came through Corinth. Everything. Which meant that people from all over the world gathered in Corinth, worked in Corinth, and many of them lived in Corinth. And so you had Roman citizens and Greeks, you had Jews who lived there, you had people from the far corners of the Roman Empire who lived there. Anybody who wanted to be in business or trade had to have a presence in Corinth. There were rich and poor, the elite, there were the, the underclass, there were slaves and free, there were people who were well-educated and people who weren't educated at all. It was probably the most diverse city in the Roman Empire in the first century. It was an amazingly eclectic place. And the interesting thing is all across the city of Corinth were all these statues and temples to every god or goddess anybody worshipped in the ancient world. And Paul planted a church there. In fact, Paul, this guy Paul, was there for 18 months. He was in Corinth longer than he was anywhere else. And he planted a church, and when he was done, it reflected the diversity of the city of Corinth. You had people from every possible and potential background. You had, you had people rich and poor, all these people rubbing shoulders with each other in the church of Jesus Christ who had given their lives to follow Jesus. And this was unique. I want, I want to make sure you understand how unique this was. In the first century, you stayed with your own people. Whatever your class of people was, that's who you did life with. That's who you did community with. You lived with your class of people. You did business with your class of people. No one else. And so the church that Paul started with all of these people from all over the world was truly unique. It was fascinating. All these different worldviews, different backgrounds, different religious histories, all together in one room. How do you think that went? Right? How do you think, hey, really, let's be honest, how do you think it went? Not well, right? Paul left after 18 months, and he hadn't been gone long when he got a letter. He got some information uh, that rivalries started popping up. People started uh, treating people differently according to what they made. Uh, you had dissension and division. The church that he had founded was breaking apart because people couldn't figure out how to exist together. Here's, here's why Paul wrote the letter. He says it right at the very beginning, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. Paul says, and this would have been read to the church uh, as they gathered. Paul wrote, now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, 
but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. Paul wrote to the church in a moment when it felt like the divisions were winning. Does that sound familiar? It ought to sound familiar. Because we live in an age, we live in a season in our world where it feels like the divisions are winning, doesn't it? It doesn't matter where, whether it's uh, in the family, uh, in our places of business, uh, at universities, at schools, in churches. It just feels like we're polarized, that we're pulled apart, that we're alienated uh, from each other. I mean, we'll fight about anything, right? We fight about, fight about climate change, whether or not we ought to use uh, plastic straws. If someone today goes online and posts that the sky is blue, what's going to happen? People are going to fight about it, right? Somebody's going to declare them a heretic. The sky has never been blue. You don't know what you're talking about. This is the world that we live in. It feels like the divisions are winning. So what do we do? What, what do we do? How do... How do we learn again how to live together even when we disagree? How do, how do we learn to do life in a way that allows us to treat each other maybe with grace and respect? Even, even when we find that there are issues that we can't be compatible on. How do we do that? 2,000 years ago, Paul wrote an entire letter about how people can exist together, even when they can't come together on certain issues. And here's the thing. Paul, when you read, and we're going to read a lot of this letter over the next few weeks, Paul tackles the tough issues. He goes uh, straight on to deal with the problems, the divisions, all that's going going wrong in the church in Corinth. But here's, here's the amazing thing. Paul doesn't start with any particular issue. Instead, what Paul does is Paul lays the groundwork for the people in Corinth, and he says to them, look, if if you want to figure your way past all this fighting, all this polarization, if you want to figure it out, then you've got to know this one thing before anything else, this one crazy and ridiculous and foolish thing. And here's what he says that foolish thing is. If you've got your Bibles, you can circle, underline, highlight. We're going to read Uh, Verse 18 in chapter 1, and we're going to skip over to verses 22 through 25. Paul says, For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And then verse 22, For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness, God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. So what is Paul saying there? Here's what he's saying there. The wisdom we've built our world on is not the wisdom that will heal the world. Let me say that again. The wisdom that we've built our world on is not the wisdom that will heal the world. So what's the wisdom that we've built our world on? What's our perspective on being a success in this life? What what does it mean in this world to have the respect of other people? Think about that. What is it? It's to win, right? It's the person who has more money, uh, more influence, more connections, more power, Those are the people who we deem success. And so our wisdom is that if we want to be a success in this world, we follow the same rules, the same wisdom that the Corinthians followed. It's the same wisdom we have today, that there must be power and that we have to have power to overcome others, to push others back, to convince them that they're wrong. That's the wisdom of the world. But Paul says, even though we built the world on that wisdom, that's not the wisdom that will move you forward. What's the definition of insanity? You, you all know this. It's overused, right? The definition of insanity is what? 
doing the same thing over and over and over again, and what? Expecting a different result. And Paul's basically telling the church in Corinth, and he's basically telling us as well, that if we continue to try to do things on uh, the, the world's terms, the wisdom of the world's terms, then that healing that we desire for our relationships, the unity and the oneness that we're called to as followers of Jesus Christ, it will always escape us. And Paul presents to us an alternative wisdom. And it's the wisdom of the cross. He says, Christ crucified is our wisdom. The cross, the cross in all of its foolishness and ridiculousness, that's the wisdom that we follow. If we want to find healing in relationships in our world. And, and, and let's, let's be honest, the cross doesn't seem all that foolish or ridiculous to us anymore, right? 2,000 years removed uh, from this. Uh, because we wear the cross as jewelry, right? Uh, if you're out in the atrium and you haven't ever looked up in the atrium, there's this, there's this beautiful 25-foot tall cross embedded in the wood panel just outside uh, this wall. For us in our day and time, the cross is this beautiful and hopeful symbol. But if we were able somehow to bring somebody from the first century and put them out in the atrium to look at that cross out there, they would shudder. They'd ask us what in the world we were doing. Why, did we, why would we ever have that anywhere where it could be seen? Because in the first century, the cross represented the power of the Romans over other people. The cross was a symbol of execution because that's how the Romans, the worst of the worst, the worst of the worst were executed on the cross. Why? So the Romans could flex their power over other people. So they could show people, if you do what they did, this is what happens to you. You will die a horrible and humiliating death. So for Paul to write that the cross is the wisdom of God. People would have been shaking their heads. Why, why, what is he saying? Why is he saying that? And here's why. Because here's what Paul knew. And I think this is, this is the truth that we know but easily forget. That out of the weakness and powerlessness and defeat and death that the cross represents, God brings life. Out of the darkest places in the world, God brings light. Out of what looks like complete and utter defeat, God brings victory. And, and what Paul is inviting the Corinthians to do, and what Paul's inviting us to do, is to think differently, think differently about our world. He's, he's attempting to reshape our imaginations of what is possible so that we don't have to live as rivals to one another but that we can see the world through the lens of the cross because when we look at the world through the lens of the cross, we see the truth that all of our power plays, all of our killer instinct about stuff, it doesn't bring life. It simply adds to the death. And when we, when we look at the world through the lens of the cross, we begin to see that maybe, maybe when we are weak and vulnerable, we find our strength. When we look through the lens of the cross, what we begin to understand is that any loss may be able to turn into victory. When we look through the lens of the cross, we begin to understand that using power plays in this world. It's not the way of Jesus. It's not the wisdom of God. Paul invites us, before he gets to anything that divides us, he invites us to, to reframe our imaginations of how we approach one another, of how we do this thing together. And here, here's what he writes in the scripture that Brandon read a few minutes ago, verses uh, 26 and, and 28. He says, consider your own call. He said, think about your own life. Brothers and sisters, not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were powerful. Uh, not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose what is Foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God says, just think about you with all of your own brokenness and your sin and the darkness that hides in your hearts. 
God still gracefully and lovingly chooses you. And because God faithfully and lovingly chooses you, foolishly chooses you and me, we're called to look at the world and understand from this foolish wisdom. And maybe what that means for us as we think about this foolish wisdom, maybe, maybe that means for us that we forgive sometimes when nobody else in our circle of friends will forgive. Maybe that means that we extend patience and grace to people who others are condemning. Maybe that means we lay down, just as Jesus laid down his life going to the cross, maybe it means we lay down sometimes our pride, our self-righteousness, our need to be right about everything. Any of you out there like me like to be right about stuff? Maybe the wisdom of the cross is that we lay that down. Maybe, maybe we announce faithfully that in moments when it feels like everything is lost and there's nothing but defeat, we announce that because we see the world through the wisdom of the cross, that failure is not final. Not your failure, not the failure of the church, not the failure of anyone. One of my favorite writers is a guy named Frederick Buechner. In one of his books, uh, Listening to Your Life, he, he wrote this. I want to read it to you. It's a longer quote than I, I normally offer, but it's so good. He writes this. If the world is sane, then Jesus is mad as a hatter. And the Last Supper is the mad tea party. The world says, mind your own business. And Jesus says, there is no such thing as your own business. The world says, follow the wisest course and be a success. And Jesus says, follow me and be crucified. The world says, drive carefully. The life you may save may be your own. And Jesus says, whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The world says, law and order. And Jesus says, love. The world says, get get and jesus says give in terms of the world's sanity jesus is crazy as a coot and anybody who thinks he can follow him without being a little crazy too is laboring less under a cross than under a delusion think about that last line anybody who thinks he can follow him without being a little crazy too is laboring less under a cross than under a delusion 2,000 years ago, Paul wrote a letter when it seemed like all the divisions of life were winning. And he called the people to foolishness. To foolish trust in a foolish God so that we might act and live foolishly in our world. And so as we enter into this season, as we enter into this series, here's what I want to, here's what I want to challenge you to do, particularly as you bump into uh, the disagreements, uh, whether it's in your family or at work, or even maybe disagreements that you've got with people in this room right now. Be aware of them. Be aware of your posture in those moments. Be aware of, of the draw of using the world's, uh, the world's wisdom. How do I push them away? How do I make sure I tell others how wrong they are? How do I defeat them? And maybe begin to pray a little bit. Maybe begin to pray a little bit. God, show me the foolish wisdom of the cross for this moment, for this situation, in this circumstance. Maybe what we need Maybe what we need in the world is not more order. Maybe what we need is a little more craziness. People who are willing to base their lives on the life of Jesus Christ crucified. There's an old story about a preacher in France. Uh, he moved to a new community and he was out visiting people. And one day he went and visited a family and the wife wasn't there, but the husband was there. And the, when the wife came home, uh, she kept asking him, well, what did, what did he say? What did, what did he tell us? And, and, and the husband said, well, he didn't say much. All he asked was, does Christ live here? 
And she said, well, did, did you tell them that we're the church's biggest givers, that we're the biggest supporters of the church? He said, well, he didn't ask about any of that. He just asked, does Christ live here? Well, did you tell them that we, we study our Bibles every morning, we pray together every day, morning and night? The husband said, well, he, he didn't ask about any of that. All he asked was, does Christ live here? Well, certainly, you must have told him how we volunteer and that how we're there every Sunday on the front row. He said he didn't ask any of that. He just wanted to know, does Christ live here? Maybe for us in the days and the months, the years ahead, maybe, maybe God needs us to be a sign and a symbol of the life of Jesus lived out. So that if there is to be healing, whether it's in our churches or our homes or in our world, it's because we, we have decided that Jesus, the crucified one, will live here. Let's pray. God, it's so easy when we bump up against people who disagree with us, who, who see the world differently politically, who, um, who maybe have done something to harm us or others that we love. It's really easy to respond, to just reflexively respond with the ways the world has taught us to respond. And yet there is another way. A way that doesn't lead to more death and destruction and pain and brokenness. A way that leads to life and healing and hope. God, may we, may we, may we focus our lives on Christ and Christ crucified. That we may see the world differently. And that we may live in our world differently as people who bear the, the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ to our world. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.